In experiment three, uh, you're going to be doing two parts. The first part of the experiment is experiment 3A where you'll be determining the best recrystallization solvent for a solid. And that's in experiment four the following week, we're going to actually be doing a macro scale recrystallization where you'll start with an impure sample of acid analyte that will look like the sample on the left and after the recrystallization process you'll end up with a much purer solid that you can see on the right. Um, the pure, pure, the pure sample is indicated by not only its color difference but also the homogeneity difference. The sample on the left you can see lots of um, inhomogeneous samples that are solids that are in there. The right is much more homogeneous and uh, uniform in color. So the first thing before doing recrystallization is we should define what it is and then how are we going to determine the best solvent for recrystallization. So recrystallization is when you take a solid and it in basically at room temperature you add a solvent to it and you end up with the solid and the solvent and there's no dissolving. There's no dissolution of the sample. Then what we do is then we heat the solution and at that point the solid dissolves. Now back in general chemistry you probably learned that for most things, and there's a couple of exceptions but really not in organic chemistry, that materials have a lower solubility at lower temperatures than they do when you have a hot or have a higher temperature. So as we heat the solution the solid will dissolve into the liquid and then at that point when we cool the solution back down what happens is that the solid then crystallizes. We might have in general chemistry called this precipitates. And we will actually use that term here, but the solid then crystallizes out of solution or precipitates and then we can go ahead and we can isolate the solid using filtration usually. You could decant but normally we'll use uh, filtration normally vacuum filtration to isolate the solid and then we would go ahead and dry the solid to remove that liquid to end up now with our solid back again and the idea here is that if a solid has some impurities in it we hope that the impurities will separate from the solid from the material that we want over the course of this recrystallization so perhaps when we add the solvent at room temperature, the solid doesn't dissolve, but maybe the impurities will. And if the impurities dissolve, then we could simply um, remove that liquid and add a purer solvent. The, when we heat, we'd either like the impurities not to dissolve, or if they do dissolve, they do not recrystallize or don't precipitate upon cooling. So the idea of recrystallization is that it is a purification technique so that the impurities will basically remain in the liquid and when we go ahead and we, and we isolate our solid of interest by filtration, the impurities will either be in the liquid or if they never dissolved at high temperatures, we simply filter the solution at that point to remove them. But recrystallization has to occur by the solid dissolving and then recrystallizing upon cooling. And the experiment we're going to do today, we're going to test recrystallization solvents to see which one is the best for a variety of solids. And we're going to basically heat the solutions up, see whether the material dissolves, and then when it cools back to room temperature, does it um, recrystallize. Now we're going to recrystallize at room temperature but sometimes um, we oftentimes will recrystallize by placing the sample in an ice bath 
or will also recrystallize by taking the, taking the solution sometimes to very cold temperatures like minus 80 degrees to get the solid to then recrystallize. So the idea is to remove impurities from our solid material. And the only way to do that is to get the solid material to dissolve and then recrystallize. So typically what, we're, what we do is we're in the experiment today you're going to take a small test tube and you're going to place a small amount of solid in that disposable test tube you're then going to add a small amount of solvent to that test tube and you're going to kind of mix this up a little bit and you're going to see does that material dissolve at room temperature if it does dissolve at room temperature then that's not going to be a good recrystallization solvent. So if this dissolves, then that's not a good recrystallization solvent because we want the material to be insoluble at room temperature. If it doesn't dissolve, then what we're going to do is then we're going to heat the solution and then we're going to look at the test tube and we're going to see did that solid then dissolve in the liquid if it doesn't dissolve here then that's not a candidate for the recrystallization solvent because we want it to dissolve it has to dissolve to be recrystallized if it does dissolve then that's good and then we'll go ahead and we'll cool that solution back down to room temperature and if we get the solid recrystallizing then then that means we have a good solvent if it doesn't if it doesn't recrystallize then that solvent is not going to be a good recrystallization solvent. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to test three different solids and five different solvents. The solids of are of different polarity as are the solvents. The solvents vary in polarity from something very polar like water to something that's not very polar like hexane. And I'll talk a little bit about polarity in a few minutes and you have to, as part of your pre-lab assignment, you're indicating the ranking, the polarity of the solids and the solvents. Now, to look at polarity, you have to go back and remember intermolecular forces from general chemistry. So you have to draw a Lewis dot structure of that solid or solvent, and then you have to figure out is that, you know, does it only undergo dispersion forces with itself? Does it undergo hydrogen bonding with itself? That will tell you a lot about the intermolecular forces and then the polarity of that solid or the solvent. But the idea here is that we're going to test each solid in five different solvents and try and come up with what the best recrystallization solvent would be for that, that solid. So in terms of recrystallization solvents then, they, there's some characteristics of the very of very good recrystallization solvents. So what we're going to say is that the solid should be very soluble in the recrystallization solvent at high temperatures, but then it should be insoluble at room temperature or lower temperatures, for instance, if we put it in an ice bath. This ensures the fact that the solid will dissolve when we heat and will recrystallize when we cool the solution back down. Um, to either room temperature or an ice bath. Now the s impurities that are present should either be completely soluble or completely insoluble in the solvent at all those temperatures so that that way they can be separated out of the uh, material either by if they're insoluble at high temperatures by then filtering them out or if they're soluble or if they're soluble if they're soluble to high temperatures, then they should also be soluble at low temperatures.
So that's ideally the best uh, recrystallization solvent will have those properties. And also that when we do cool our solution, we should get well-formed and large crystals formed. Um, and that's something we'll deal with in experiment 3B. And it's we want well-formed crystals or we want large crystals because they're easier to filter and then that will aid in us not losing product um, because the crystals either run through the filter paper as we're filtering or that we lose them simply because they stick to the side of the container and they're hard to see. So we want well-formed crystals. And then the final property for recrystallization solvent should be that when we're all said and done and we've recrystallized our solid and we've filtered it, we'd like the solvent to have a relatively low boiling point so that we can easily remove that by evaporation. And typically we evaporate the solvent um, from crystals by filtration and then allowing the suction filtration to blow basically air over the crystals, which hopefully causes the solvent to evaporate. We will also put them in a, on a watch glass or an aluminum dish and put them inside of an oven in order to evaporate the solvent that way. So we really would like a solvent that has a low boiling point so that the crystals will dry very easily and more importantly very quickly. Now what you're going to do in this experiment then is you're going to try three different solvents and your, those sol solids are things like benzoic acid, transtilbene, and I forget what the third one is. You're going to try, you're going to determine the re ideal recrystallization solvent for those while in one of five different solvents, the five different solvents that you're going to use are water, um, alcohol and alcohol and a, you're going to use um, ethanol as the alcohol you're going to use a hydrocarbon solvent or a nonpolar solvent hexane uh, there's another nonpolar solvent toluene and then also acetone which is of moderate polarity and so you're going to try these different solvents to recrystallize the trans still being the nine fluorinone and the benzoic acid in your in the pre-lab assignment asked to look up their structures and to rank them according to their polarity. Now, as I said earlier, polarity deals with intermolecular forces and whether the molecule is polar or not. Here's a chart that's at the end of your handout that gives you some of the solvents that you'll be using. And those solvents then have a certain polarity um, and that can be measured by the dielectric constant. Water has the highest dielectric constant, so therefore it's the most polar, and hexane in this case has the lowest dielectric constant, and it's the least polar. But hexane is made up of, if we drew out the Lewis dot structure for hexane, it would be CH3, CH2, another CH2. It's six carbons and then 14 hydrogens. So it's only made of carbon and hydrogens. From general chemistry, you should know that that is that the best intermolecular force the two hexane molecules can go, the strongest force is going to be dispersion. And you can look up the structure of these other solvents. But in the end, we're going to see if there's a correlation between solvent polarity and the solute polarity. So if I have a nonpolar sol solute, what polarity of solvent is going to make the best recrystallization solvent? Something that's very polar, something of intermediate polarity, or something that's very nonpolar? And I have to say that's our goal. Whether our data will give us a clean answer to that remains to be seen. It could be that we have some general ideas, but we really have to do a trial and error in order to determine the best recrystallization solvent and that's where we're going to start this week is determining the best recrystallization solvent for the three solids
and then next week before you do acid analyd you're going to do the same experiment to determine the polarity of or determine what recrystallization solvent you would use for acid analyd okay so that's our experiment um, 3a you're going to work in groups of two and maybe three on this experiment in order to cut down the materials so you're going to work in groups and you're going to then determine and test the three different solids into the th five different solvents in order to determine that which is the best recrystallization solvent so you're going to take three solids test it with five solvents you're going to place small portions of the solid into small disposable test tubes you're going to add drops of solvent to it and see if it dissolves at room temperature if it does game's over you don't go any further that solvent is not the best recrystallization solvent for that solid if it doesn't dissolve then you're going to heat the test tube in a hot water bath you're going to see whether it dissolves if it doesn't dissolve again that solvent is out as a possible recrystallization solvent if it does dissolve then you're going to cool back to room temperature to see if it recrystallizes if it does recrystallize then you've got a good recrystallization solvent if it doesn't recrystallize then that's a that's not a good recrystallization solvent now one of the things you're going to have to be careful of in this in these tests are that solvents that have very low boiling points things like hexane and acetone you're going to have to be very careful that when you heat the sample in the test tube on the hot water bath that you're not you're not evaporating the solvent and therefore seeing the solids sort of precipitate so we have to use for acetone and for hexanes you're going to use the steam that's coming off the hot water bath or just take the test tube and slightly touch it to the hot water bath in order to get the sample in order to get the liquid hot because if you if you plunge the test tube into a really hot water bath all your solvents going to evaporate and you're not going to be able then to distinguish whether it's a good solvent because the solvent will all evaporate so you want to look at your directions and it tells you about that it also tells you how to handle things that are partially salt soluble and what you should do there okay so that's what we're going to do is we're going to test the three solids and the five solvents at the end you're going to end up with um, ideally one or two recrystallization solvents there's always a possibility that none of the solvents may be a good recrystallization solvent and then try and answer is there a correlation between the solute and the solvent polarity once we find the ideal recrystallization solvent you're going to submit a report form that you will fill out for experiment 3a and that um, report form is on the blackboard site I believe in the handout um, so that's what you're going to turn in for experiment 3a again you're going to do this in groups and when you're finished with experiment 3a then you're going to move on and do experiment 3b and I'm going to caution you that the experiment 3a and 3b will be done during uh, the celebration of the spirit week uh, that day and so our labs are going to be cut by at least an hour in the morning labs you'll be working from 8 to 11 on that Thursday if you're in the Thursday class sorry if you're in the Tuesday class nothing changes but if you're in the Thursday class um, you'll be working from 8 to 11 and in the afternoon on Thursday September 13th lab will start at 2 30 and go to five so it's important for those of you in the Thursday lab to make sure that you've watched the video and if and that you're prepared because there'll be very sh very short and minimal pre-lab lectures on that day Thursday um, so that you can uh, get started and finish the lab during the shortened lab period